Well, congregation, if you've ever watched a court trial before, you probably remember the scene well. You remember the judge as he sits before his table with the gavel off to his side. And you remember perhaps the the prosecuting lawyer off to one side and the defendant off to the other. And and you remember seeing the, the jury off to the side. And then you see the one who's standing trial, sitting there by himself. As an example, perhaps some of you remember all the way back to the 60s, the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Switzerland. Adolf Eichmann was one of the masterminds behind the Holocaust in Germany. And if you've ever watched the recordings or if you remember far enough back to remember that time, you'll remember the great solemnity and purpose with which that trial was conducted. The whole world had its eyes fixated on that trial, and it was conducted accordingly. Well, the passage that we have before us today in this uh, chapter 1 of Isaiah, paints a similar picture. The whole book of Isaiah really is a court case between the covenant-keeping Lord God of Israel and the covenant-breaking Israel. And Isaiah stands as the mouthpiece of God in this case. And he acts as both the prosecutor and as, as the court herald. And he presents before the people the evidence against the accused and the verdict that's currently standing against the accused and also what the judge's desired outcome is. And as we hear this and we we think about this scene of God speaking, prosecuting his covenant people, We need to remember that although this was written many years ago to the covenant people of God, it also applies to each one of us here today. Every baptized forehead in our midst has this message directed to them. And therefore, we have to give earnest heed to the word that God sets before us in these verses. Now, we're going to consider our passage under five headings, and you can see those headings in your bulletin. But before we go through those, I want to briefly give you some background to this court case. And we'll take that background from the first verse of our chapter. Verse 1 that we read really acts as an introduction to the, the whole book of Isaiah and to this chapter in particular. And many scholars, as they've researched the book, and as they've tried to understand what normally happened when books were written, believe that this verse acted as the title that was pinned or posted in the temple so that all the people, as they walked by, could see the title and and then go in and and look at the manuscript, look at the book. Well, let's let's read that title then in verse 1 again so that we get an idea of what was written there. Verse 1 says, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So that's what would likely have been written up, posted as the title for this book. And the first question that may come to your mind as you read this verse is, what exactly is this vision that was given to Isaiah? Well, the first thing we need to understand is that this vision isn't like a a video that you might watch on your phone. It wasn't a visual that Isaiah looked at and then wrote down. More properly, this would have been something like a, um, a mental understanding or a knowledge passed from God to Isaiah, particularly concerning what had happened in Israel in the past and what was happening at the present, what, what would happen in the future, And then, perhaps most importantly, what God God desired should happen in Judah and Jerusalem. 
And further to this, this, this information that Isaiah is given is not just a mass of knowledge that God passed into his mind to just for his own understanding. God had a purpose in giving Isaiah this vision. And just as we're given a purpose when we're given the word of God, so Isaiah was given one, and his purpose was to stand before God's people with God's words as God's special messenger. Well, verse 1 tells us something else that's very notable and that we need to pay attention to this morning. And that is that this was a very long court case. We read that it was the vision that happened during the days of Uzziah. That's one king. Jotham, that's another. Ahaz, another. And Hezekiah, that's four kings that his court case, if you will, took place during. And if you look and do some research into the history, you find out that that span of time covered almost 80 years. Imagine that, a court case for 80 years long between God and his people. To give us a little bit of context, if we put that into our day and age, that would be a court case that started back before World War II and extended all the way till today. And and perhaps we think, well, that's, that's an incredibly long court case, and I just, there, there's no context for that in my mind. Or perhaps you think, well, there, there, there have been very long court cases in the U.S. history, and I'm thinking of a couple of them right now. Well, think about why those court cases went on for so long. Perhaps there was a lack of evidence, and the, the jury and the judges just couldn't come to a decision as to what was right. Or perhaps there's been a broken justice system, and, and there was things going on that prevented the case from closing. Or perhaps the court was just inept. They just couldn't get their act together. And so the case just went on and on and on. Or perhaps there were lawyers paid to keep the case going on and on. But in this case, in this court case of God against Israel, none of those reasons apply. There was plenty of evidence for God to condemn Israel. There was no broken justice system. The court was not inept, and there were no lawyers who were keeping the case open. The only reason this case lasted for 80 years, and really for many years longer than that, is because of the mercy and the long-suffering of God. And God, as as he does this, as he waits all those years through the book of Isaiah, prosecuting his people is really putting on full display for us and for his people back then the promise that he gave to Moses all the way back in the book of Exodus. Perhaps you remember these words from Exodus 34 when God was speaking to Moses. We read in verse 5 of that chapter that the Lord descended in the cloud. Remember, this is on Mount Sinai where the law was given. So the Lord descended in the cloud and stood... With him, that's Moses, there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And ever since God uttered those words all those years back then, he had been practicing that, showing patience and long-suffering to Israel. And now he comes again in the book of Isaiah. And you would think at this point he would be ready to condemn Israel. But again, he comes in mercy, offering them peace and pardon if they will just repent from their sins. And that brings us to the beginning of our court case in verse 2. If you'll look at it there with me, we'll see how it opens with the father's call to attention. He begins with these words, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Well, here we have the the setting of the court scene beginning to take shape. Isaiah is, as it were, a herald standing in the middle of this court scene. And he's speaking, as it were, through a loudspeaker to everyone there. And he cries out in full volume, first of all, to the witnesses. And he says, give ear, O earth, O heavens, and give ear, 
O earth. Now perhaps you think those are strange witnesses to call to a court case. We've never experienced anything like this, have we? We're used to perhaps uh, court cases in small rooms or, or a stuffy brick room. But nothing like this where it's as if th- that Isaiah is standing in the middle of God's creation and he's calling earth and heaven to attention. But perhaps you ask, why is God calling the heaven and the earth as witnesses before this court case? Well, perhaps there are a num- number of reasons for this, but perhaps the most simple reason is that heaven and earth have been witnesses of everything that has happened from the beginning of time to the beginning of this scene in Isaiah 1. They were there at the creation of man as God God created the very pinnacle of his creation. And they were there at that first covenant made with Adam where God, in effect, told Adam, do this and live. And they were there when Adam and Eve broke that covenant. And ever since, they've been groaning and waiting, travailing, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. And then they would have been there at the flood as all creation was washed, as it were, clean from the sin of man. And then they would have been there at the covenant that God made with the patriarchs. Think of Abraham as God speaks to him and he says, Abraham, look at the stars. Look at the sand of the seashore. So will your seed be. And then in in Deuteronomy 4, Moses, as he's standing before Israel, he says he calls heaven and earth to witness against Israel if they will not keep the covenant of the Lord. And then again in Deuteronomy 32, which is well known as the covenant song, Moses says, give ear, O ye heavens, And I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. So heaven and earth are appropriate witnesses for this court case against Israel. But let's return now to these opening words of God's herald as he calls the court to attention. He says, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Isaiah had called for their attention. But at these last words, it's almost as if heaven and earth would have, would have jerked to attention. When man speaks, it's one thing, but when God calls for attention, it's an entirely another thing. We read in Psalm 29 that the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. And so when God speaks, this courtroom of heaven and earth keep silence. They wait, as it were, with bated breath to hear what God would have to say to them. And we can learn from this, can't we, that we too ought to keep silence when God speaks. We need to have that attitude that Samuel had. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Well, what does God have to say To these witnesses. Read it with me in the last part of verse 2. He says, I have nourished and brought up children. What a shocking statement for a judge to make in a court. This isn't what we expect in a courtroom, is it? Here God is has, as it were, pointed his finger at the one who is being accused, and it's not some stranger or some enemy but it's children. This isn't what we expect, is it? We might expect a king against his subjects or a god against his creatures, but a father standing in court with his children. This isn't something that we would expect. And now God's herald, Isaiah, has the attention of everyone in that courtroom. What has brought matters to such a pass 
Well, God does not leave his witnesses in suspense. He gives the reason for bringing children into court. We can read it at the end of verse 2. He says, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Well, when we think of rebellion, perhaps we, we don't think too much of it. We hear rebellion often in our culture. Perhaps some of you have parents who remember the 60s and all the, the, the acts of rebellion that happened then. And even in our time, law and order is, is often uh, put to shame and rebellion is held up as the thing to do. But God doesn't see rebellion as a little thing. We read that God calls rebellion as similar to the sin of witchcraft. And the witchcraft in, in Israel's time was a sin punishable by death. And if we compare Israel's rebellion against God to something in our time today, we wouldn't compare it to, say, a citizen getting too many speeding tickets and offending a police officer, or a student misbehaving one too many times against her teacher. As wrong as these things are, they don't capture the essence of the rebellion of Israel against God. This rebellion of Israel against God is is a child rebelling against his parents. This is a child going from childhood, from being a young child, up to being a teenager, up to being a, a young adult and into his 20s, and all that time growing in misbehavior, and to a place of open rebellion. This is, this is a child, as it were, slapping their parent in the face, in the face of all of their goodness. This is Israel saying to God, really, I want nothing to do with you, God. So as we hear this cry of God, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. What is this cry? What's the nature of this cry? Perhaps you think it's an an angry cry. Or perhaps you think it's it's a vengeful cry. Or perhaps a a bitter cry. Or even even a distant cry as, as God moves away from his children. Well, in many ways, it should be all of those things, shouldn't it be? But what this cry really is, is a father's cry of spurned love and injured justice. This is God calling to account his covenant children to the subscription that they made many years ago. Perhaps you remember how Israel subscribed to the covenant so many years earlier back in Exodus. There they stood at Mount Sinai. God had read the law to them, just as I read the law to you earlier from Exodus 20. And the people heard it, and they saw the thundering and the lightning. And then they replied with with this. They said, "All all the words which the Lord hath said will we do. They committed themselves, didn't they? They committed themselves to the covenant. But now, through hundreds of years, they had disobeyed God time and time again. And despite all of God's discipline, they still hadn't listened. And now the Father is bringing them to account. But even as he brings them to account, his heart towards them is not the heart of one who desires to destroy them. It's the heart of a father. This is a similar picture to the the father of the prodigal son, which Jesus tells of in the New Testament, where the father was watching for the son to return. And this attitude of God becomes clear through the rest of Isaiah. Only a little bit later in our chapter, we read these words, which I think all of you know, where the Lord says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, They shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And then, after 54 chapters of continued refusal to hear God's word, we read these words in Isaiah 54. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. 
Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And then, further to the north, where Hosea is a prophet, we read these words from God. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboim? Mine heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. Matthew Henry, when he speaks of this this passage in Hosea, says that divine justice said, make them as Adma, set them as Zeboim, but mercy said, how shall I do it? So this courtroom accusation of God is not first the cry of a judge who desires and longs to punish his children, but it's first the longing cry of a father whose mercy shines all the clearer as his justice approaches. God will have justice, but oh how he longs for men and women and boys and girls to take shelter under his wings of mercy. Perhaps as an example you've observed, uh, maybe even in the past weeks or months, a storm brewing off in the distance and you, you hear the thunder and perhaps you can even see the rain off in the distance, but it hasn't reached you yet. But you know that as the storm approaches, this is not the time to be outside playing in the fields or out on the streets. Now is the time to go indoors. And it's the same way with God's judgment, isn't it? It's really God's mercy that he allows us to see the thunderstorms of his judgment off in the distance, calling us to take shelter in Jesus Christ. Well, what about us here today, congregation? Have we committed to the Lord, as Israel did, that all the words which the, which the Lord has said we will do, but then gone our own ways and partaken in all the acceptable sins of our culture? Perhaps the Lord says of us as well, as he looks down from heaven, I have raised up this man or this woman or this boy, or this girl here in New Jersey, and they have rebelled against me. Does the Lord stand here today as your covenant prosecutor? And if he does, what is your reaction to the fatherly heart of God as he prosecutes your case? What is your impulse as you hear, as it were, the thunderstorms of God's justice raging off in the distance. Do you run to him for mercy? Or do you, as it were, put your fingers in your ears and and continue on in your ways of sin? If you have run to him for mercy, then you are safe in Christ. But if you have not, you are still in the open fields of sin and the storm may hit you at any time. Well, perhaps some of you here think, well, this isn't really all that important to me because the sins that, that I have are hidden sins and, and really God doesn't see them. They're sins that are in my heart and no one else knows about them. Or perhaps they're sins that, that I've only committed in my room or in my car or, or somewhere far from home, somewhere that no one else has seen. Perhaps you're like those men in Ezekiel who sinned behind closed doors And then said, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. But we read in our passage today that God has called the very heavens and the earth as witnesses against you. As one pastor once put it, if someone were to put a microphone up to the earth, what would it have to say about your life? We read in the book of Hebrews that all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And as Hagar confessed in Genesis 16, perhaps you children remember this verse, thou God seest me. Friends, we should always live in a state of certainty 
that our sins will find us out. The Apostle Paul says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But as we think about these things and as we search our own consciences and our own hearts, let's return now to Israel in verse 3 as they stand in this courtroom with the heavens and the earth watching. Despite God's warnings, they would not listen, would they? And so God describes them this way in verse 3. He says, The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Not only had Israel rebelled against God's immense goodness, they had rebelled almost, you could say, to a point of unnaturalness. Even the dullest animals know who their master is. And they know where to go to get food and where their place of sleep is. But Israel doesn't understand. John Kelvin remarked on this passage that the beasts or the animals frequently observe the order of nature more correctly and display greater kindness than men themselves. What about us here today? Are we acting in some ways worse than the animals? If we are, then we need to confess that the Lord, he is our God. He is the one who provides all things for us. And we are the sheep of his pasture. But now turn with me from the the father's prosecution to the father's reproach. In verse 4, we see that Israel has still not turned. And this far, Isaiah has been speaking to the heavens and the earth, and he's been presenting before them the general facts of the case. But here his intensity begins to increase. In verse 4, it's as if he's bringing a spotlight onto Israel, and he's really publicly shaming them for their behavior before God. God had found them naked and hungry and about to die in the wilderness And then he had cleaned them and clothed them and fed them and provided them with everything that they needed. But now look at them. How does God describe them? Well, first he begins by describing their identity. He begins by describing who they are. He begins with these words. We have in the English, awe, sinful nation. But really he's saying, woe. Sinful nation. It's a word word of judgment, a a word of cursing upon Israel. But what does God mean when he calls them a sinful nation? Well, we know that to sin is to miss the mark. It's to miss the mark of the glory of God. And when we think of missing the mark, perhaps some of us think of of, uh, a target. Perhaps we've used our bow and arrow or guns and we've shot at the target. And we've missed the target. We've gone wide or perhaps we've missed the target altogether. And we think about that and and why do we miss? Well, we miss because of a lack of ability. We haven't trained ourselves enough to hit the target. But in regards to sin, we do not miss the target because we have a lack of ability We miss the target because we're aiming at an entirely different target. We're not aiming at the target of God's glory. We're aiming at the target of our own glory. And so God describes Israel as a sinful nation, a nation who, as it were, have veered from the target of God's glory and gone seeking after their own. But then second, he describes them as a people who are laden or loaded with iniquity. Perhaps some of you have gone on long long hikes, as I have, and you've carried a heavy backpack on your shoulder filled with all the things that you need for days. And as the miles go on and as you hike, the burden becomes heavier and heavier, and you start to feel weighed down by by this burden of this backpack. Or perhaps you've you've helped someone move something, maybe a couch or a piano, and you've carried it, and you've, you've, you've been carrying it. Perhaps you've had to carry it a little ways, and you've started to, to stagger under the load of the couch or the piano. Well, that's really the picture that God is giving us here of Israel. 
they're, they're loaded down with iniquity. Well, what, what is iniquity? Well, iniquity can be described as evil that brings on or brings to itself guilt. So Israel has, as it were, on their back an increasing load of evil and guilt, and they're being bowed down under it. It's as if the whole nation is tottering under an immense weight of guilt. But God doesn't stop there, does he? Continue looking with me at how he describes them. He says that they are a seed of evildoers. Well, what does, what does God mean by calling them a seed of evildoers? Well, Israel had been set apart as a holy nation, a nation that was to be purified from all the sins of the surrounding nations. But now, when God calls them a seed of evildoers, he's really saying, you look like you had terrible parents. You look like you had parents who didn't raise you in the fear of the Lord. And then he calls them, fourthly, that children that are corruptors. So not only did they have uh, good parents, but they also had parents who raised them carefully and purely in the ways of the Lord. But now they're so, so warped, they're, they're characterized by corruption. Perhaps, parents, you've given your children gifts before. Perhaps you've given your young children a toy, and that child used the toy to hit their sibling. That child was, was corrupting the use of that toy. The toy was designed to be played with, but now it's being used to hit someone else, so it was corrupted. Or perhaps you gave your teenager a baseball bat, and they went and they vandalized property. Or, or your young adult a vehicle, and they used it as a getaway car for a bank robbery. In all those situations, the children are corrupting the good gifts that God has given them. And that's exactly what Israel had done with the gifts God gave them. God had given them many things, hadn't he? He'd given them a land flowing with milk and honey. And what had they done with that land? They took it and they used it for themselves. They were supposed to feed the poor and to take care of those who were in trouble. But instead, they used it for themselves and they used their wealth to build idols. And they, sometimes they even gave their children to be sacrificed as the nations around them. So all the good things God had given them, they were corrupting. And so God calls them children that are corruptors. So this is how God describes his people, Israel. It's a pretty dark picture, isn't it? But God doesn't stop with describing their identity. He also describes their actions. And he says this, first, that they have forsaken the Lord. Well, I think there are few pains in this life like the pain of a child leaving his parents. And perhaps some of you here even know this pain, maybe not physically, maybe your children haven't run away, but you know it emotionally, your children growing distant from you. But here Israel has forsaken the most loving parent they could possibly have asked for. But then God doesn't stop there. He says not only that they've forsaken the Lord, but that they've provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. Well, God's disposition towards Israel was, and in many ways is now, a disposition of mercy. But now it's as if Israel is, is pouring gasoline onto the fire of God's wrath. He says they've provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. That's a dangerous thing for Israel to do. And then God says that they have gone away backwards. They haven't just forsaken the Lord. It's as if they've walked farther and farther and farther away from God. Spurgeon says that if God were a demon, man could hardly be more cold towards him. Well, what, what an incredible thing for the father to say to his children in court. And what a terrible, what terrible sins for Israel to commit against their father. But it, it is just for God to say these things, isn't it? And it's necessary that Israel hear them 
Because Israel, just like each one of us here today, has to see the darkness of their own situation. But now we move from the reproach of God to the Father's plea. And as we do so, let's remember the courtroom setting that we find ourselves in. Isaiah, as God's representative, has, has, like a herald, called the witnesses to attention. He set out the details of the prosecution now. And now he turns from looking around the courtroom and he looks towards the accused. And he begins with these words. You can read them with me in verses 5 through 8. Why would ye, why would ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion that's Israel or Jerusalem, is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Well, we won't go into all the details here that are given to us, but the picture is clear, isn't it? Israel as a nation and and the majority of the people in Israel were in a terrible place. They were like a person who was full of cuts, and wounds and bruises that hadn't been taken care of and were beginning to become infected. And God was the one who was wielding the rod of discipline. And and as they suffered under his rod, he puts to them this question that we read at the beginning of verse 5. Why would you be stricken anymore? Children, perhaps you've experienced this on a much smaller scale. Perhaps you've, you've disobeyed your parents and they've disciplined you. And, and you've perhaps made resolves not to do it again. But then you've done it again and they've disciplined you again. And it happens time and time again. And your parents come to you and they say, why, why, why do you insist on being disciplined? That's exactly what God is saying to Israel. He's saying, why would you be disciplined I keep on calling you to repentance, but you insist on sinning. And congregation, that is also how God treats us at times, isn't it? Sometimes he brings painful circumstances into our lives, not because he's angrily judging us to condemnation, but because he's disciplining us to purify us from our sin and and to help us to come back to himself. And the question is, do we let patience have her perfect work when God disciplines us? Or do we ignore the rod and staff of our shepherd like Israel did and continue on in our sin? Well, perhaps some of you here are in that place today and you've, you've been ignoring the call of God in your life to live in righteousness and you feel like you're living under the disciplining hand of God. Perhaps these are because of outward circumstances. There's relational things that are going on in your life, or perhaps financial things, or perhaps even physical things. Uh, Or perhaps they're more inward. Your soul and your heart feel, as it were, bruised by sin. And you feel that, that God is far from you. And it's been a long time since you've tasted of the soul satisfying mercies of God in Christ Jesus. Perhaps you feel as the psalmist felt in Psalm 38 that there's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head. As an heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt. There's that picture again, right? Same, the same way Israel is. My wounds stink and are corrupt. Because of my foolishness, I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Well, if you're in this place today, do you hear that the Father's plea 
Why, why would you be disciplined anymore, son or daughter? Why would you be stricken? And do you feel the implications of this plea? Do you see that, that God is doing this not out of a heart of anger against you, but because he loves you? And he has an openness to receive you back, even a desire to be in communion with you, just as he had a desire to be in communion with Israel and with David in the psalm that we just read. And if you, if you have felt these stripes of God, as it were, on your back, and you've, you've heard his plea to stop sinning and to come to him, have you done what, what David did in Psalm 38 that we just read, where he declared his iniquity and he was sorry for his sin? Well, I pray that if you have felt the disciplining hand of God, you have come to this place where you've confessed your sin and you've received mercy. But as we look back at our text and we see what Israel is doing, and we hear God's plea for them to return, perhaps we have hope that after all these things, Israel will finally, now they'll capitulate, they'll return to the Lord. But what do we read in the second part of verse 5? God says, why would ye be stricken anymore? But then he says these words, ye will revolt more and more. What a statement for God to make. But this is really the end of the matter in regards to Israel and in regards to each of us sitting here today. On our own, we will revolt more and more. In Psalm 14, we read these well-known words, that the Lord looked down from heaven You get the picture of God looking down on each one of us with his eyes of fire, as it were. And he looks down upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. But then here's his conclusion. They are all gone aside. They've gone out of the way. They've missed the mark, just like we talked about before. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Well, this is the dark reality of our own hearts that no matter how much discipline we receive or how persuasive God might reason with us or how wonderful the reward God might present before us, on our own, we will revolt more and more. So as we stand with Israel in the courtroom of God's justice, perhaps you're thinking, what hope is there for us? What hope is there for Israel If our natural heart response to God is just rebellion time and time again, how can there be any hope for us? And this is where we desperately need verse 9. Here we see, as it were, the light at the end of the tunnel. This is like a a glimmer of dawn after the end of of a long and dreary night. We read these words, Accept the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. It's hard to find more wonderful words in scripture than these words, except the Lord. Isaiah doesn't say, except for some of you who worked really, really hard and were very righteous and and managed to win my favor. He doesn't say that, does he? And he doesn't also say, except for some of you whose good deeds Just tip the balance over your evil deeds. No, there's nothing here about the righteousness of man that brings salvation, but everything about the righteousness of God. In fact, the whole book of Isaiah, really, if you read through it, is about this this phrase, except for God, except the Lord. In Isaiah 59, we read these words. That's all the way towards the end of Isaiah And the Lord saw it. He saw the dire plight of his people. And it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man. And wondered that there was no intercessor. And then what's his conclusion? Therefore, therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it sustained him. 
And at the same time as Isaiah was speaking to Israel, Hosea was speaking to the northern kingdom. And Hosea says these famous words, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. That's the picture we have of Israel today, isn't it? And the picture we have of ourselves. They are destroyed, but in me is thy help. And then we have that same theme carried over into the New Testament, don't we? You know these words probably from Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But then we have these famous words, don't we? But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead. That's Israel, isn't it? That's each of us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. You know, I had a a Sunday school teacher when I was young, perhaps the age of some of you here today. And every time he came to this, he loved this passage, and every time he came to it, he would just pause. And then he would say it with so much emotion, sometimes tears streaming down his eyes. But God. And that's the exact message we have in this book of Isaiah. Accept the Lord. If it wasn't for God, where would we be? Well, I don't know your situation. Perhaps today you are struggling with health problems or sickness, or perhaps you have difficult children or tensions in your marriage, or perhaps you have financial problems, or there's some thorn in the flesh that won't leave you alone, or temptations that you can't get rid of. Or perhaps as Israel, you find yourself unable, even refusing to stop rebelling, against the Lord. Well, if you leave God out of the picture, it'll be darkness around you. But with God, there is hope. With God, your sickness is no longer a reason for despair. With God, you see your sickness as something that is working together for good because you love God, because you're called according to his purpose. Or or with difficult children, instead of anger and frustration, you can turn to your father because you see him working even through this. You see him teaching you through your children how you often act to your father in heaven. And you learn to have patient dependence on your father. Or if you have a strained marriage, instead of giving up, you cry out to God for more love, for more grace. Or if you have financial problems, instead of giving into that stress that just eats away at your hearts, You remember that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All of these things in this world are his. And the reason the Lord has put you in this place is because he wants to test you and to train you and to discipline you and to teach you to become more like Christ. Or if you're struggling with temptations that won't leave you alone, often it's it's tempting in those times to despair in the goodness of God, isn't it? And yet when we have God in the picture, we realize that God is teaching us to take that shield of faith to stop the fiery darts of the devil. Or if, we're, if our hearts are always tended to rebellion, we learn that even in our rebellion, we must call out to God to teach us to submit to his will and to find salvation in Jesus Christ. So when you have God in the picture, all these things in our lives that that cause us to despair and become hopeless change. We see a purpose in them. We see that God will not always leave us in this place. Where God is in the situation, there will always be an accept the Lord for all those who place their trust in him. Well, as we come to a close of this passage and And of the sermon today, perhaps some of you have experienced what we've been talking about. You've been in this courtroom before, and you've pled 
on the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. And you've tasted the the wonderful grace of God and his forgiveness of sin. But here you are, again, you're backslidden. And the devil cries out in your ear, he's whispering in your ear, how can you be forgiven again? And your conscience is crying out against you, what are you doing sinning? And you think that the Lord can't have mercy on me. Well, when God should have, as it were, slammed the gavel down and said, the court order is final, you're condemned, he stopped. He waited. He withheld. Why did he do this? Why does God withhold his judgment from all those who put their trust, who have put their trust in him? Well, there's only one reason, and I think all of us know it very well. And that is, if you follow the picture of this courtroom scene, that as all creation is is staring on on this scene, and as the evidence against us grows higher and higher, and our, our own sins condemn us before God, there's another figure there standing in the courtroom, isn't there? Perhaps Israel didn't see him as they listened to God's words. And perhaps you don't see him there today, but he is there, and he stood there all along. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he stands as the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. He's the one who Isaiah says later in chapter 53, who was wounded for our transgressions. He was the one bruised for our iniquities. All that backsliding, all the despair, all the lack of trust in God. This is what bruised Christ. We read that with his stripes are we healed. And the chastisement of our peace is upon him. So if you are standing in this courtroom today again and you feel your conscience and the devil crying out against you, perhaps you fear that Jesus Christ will not come this time. Perhaps he will not stand and mediate between you and your just God. But we read these words in Isaiah chapter 40. Fear not. Fear not, thou worm Jacob. That's not a very nice title, is it, to be called a worm? And yet that is what we are in our sin. But God says, fear not, thou worm Jacob. And ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Well, perhaps you haven't come to this courtroom ever before, and yet you feel that the the evidence of sin is piling up, and you feel yourself, as it were, dragged, kicking and screaming into this courtroom, and as you stand before God, you you really do feel like God is going to, to slam that gavel down and condemn you to an eternity in hell, but what do you do? What do you do if your conscience is accusing you? and and the devil is is condemning you, and you've never come to Christ for salvation. Well, there's only one thing to do, and that is to look, to turn away from yourself and from, from all your sins, and to turn and look full on the wonderful face of Jesus Christ. And there at his feet lay your life, lay your sins, your weaknesses, your failings, your brokenness, even your rebellion. Even your inability to do what God commands in every single area. And leave them in his hands, pleading with him to be your savior. Your mediator, the the courtroom mediator between you and a just God. And he will be yours. The Lord says that all who come to him, I will in no wise cast out. If we have that promise, we can lean upon that promise, whether it be for the thousandth time or even for the first time here today. So in conclusion, let me ask each of you here today, have you seen him? Have your eyes been opened to the reason for the long-suffering patience of God? All through those hundreds of years as he spared Israel from destruction, why? Was it because of Moses ultimately? We know Moses interceded for God, didn't he, on Mount Sinai? But it wasn't ultimately because of Moses. It was because of Jesus Christ. And as we sit here today and we think about how many times we should have been 
destroyed for our sin. Why has God withheld and waited? It's because of Jesus Christ. And if you don't see Jesus Christ here today, well, there's really nothing more beautiful in all the world, is there? And also, there's nothing more necessary for you to have. Jesus Christ is that except for God that saved Israel and will save all those who come to him in faith. He is, if you will, the courtroom gospel for all sinners who stand condemned before the Lord and God in heaven. Well, as we close, I pray that not one of you will finish this life without having come to Jesus Christ as your only mediator, as the only hope for needy sinners. Let's pray. Great God and Father in heaven, we come before thee, having heard this sobering word of the guilt and the sin of man, and how each one of us has gone astray and turned to our own ways. But we thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast laid upon Jesus Christ the iniquity of us all, and that by his stripes we are healed. Lord, I pray that if there are any here today who have not tasted and seen that the Lord is good through Jesus Christ, that even today they would turn to the Lord and would be found of him and so be saved. Lord, we do ask that you would bless this word to each of us and that believers would be strengthened and that those who are weak in faith would be continued and kept upon their ways. And go with us also, Lord, as we go from this place and bring us together in safety once again this afternoon. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.